This is Philosophy 102, Introduction to Logic. My name is Cecilia Moon, and this is Part 2 of Lesson 7. So in Part 1 of Lesson 7, we discuss the various forms of these inductive arguments and the fact that for some of them, their names will be different depending on the quality of the reasoning that the argument uses. So for example, we discussed how inductive generalizations, otherwise known as generalizations, only refers to the strong version of this type or form of argument. If we have a weak version of this type or form of argument, we would have what is called a hasty generalization. However, other arguments will not change in their name depending on the quality of their reasoning. For example, an argument based on sign will always be called an argument based on sign regardless of the quality of its reasoning. So we would differentiate weak and strong arguments based on sign by simply indicating that they are either weak arguments based on sign or strong argument based on sign. We also discussed how these arguments are inductive arguments and in what way that they would differ from deductive arguments. As we've discussed, an inductive argument is an argument incorporating the claim that it is improbable that the conclusion is false given that the premises are true. And the distinct characteristic of inductive arguments is that they use a different kind of reasoning from that of deductive arguments. Inductive arguments use inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is the kind of reasoning in which the intent of the author is that the premises provide support for the conclusion being probably true. This is different from deductive arguments in that for deductive arguments, the kind of reasoning is one in which the intent of the author is that the premises provide support for the conclusion being definitely true. We also discussed how doing an evaluation of inductive arguments is similar in some ways and different in other ways from evaluating deductive arguments. Like deductive arguments, we would do a truth value analysis of inductive arguments in which we simply want to determine the actual truth of the premises. Also, we would conduct a logical analysis for inductive arguments. However, when we conduct a logical analysis for inductive arguments, rather than determining the validity of these arguments, what we want to determine is the strength or degree of support that the premises provide to the conclusion. The two values or qualities that we use in order to discuss the strength of an inductive argument is that of strong and weak. Rather than as in deductive arguments, we speak of the quality of the reasoning of deductive arguments as valid or invalid. Finally, we also discussed how we evaluate the argument as a whole of inductive arguments as well. In evaluating the argument as a whole, as with deductive arguments, we bring together the truth value analysis and logical analysis in order to determine how good the argument is as a whole. When doing so, what we're interested in is whether the argument is cogent or uncogent. Cogent or uncogent refers to the quality of the argument as a whole. Cogent arguments are good inductive arguments and uncogent arguments are bad inductive arguments. This is similar with deductive arguments. However, with deductive arguments, we use the words sound and unsound to refer respectively to good deductive arguments and bad deductive arguments. Now for the remaining of the semester, we're going to focus on how to conduct a logical analysis on various different types of inductive arguments. In this lesson, we'll concentrate on analogical arguments. But before we begin to discuss how to analyze analogical arguments, what we want to do is make sure that we have a clear understanding of what logical analysis of inductive arguments entail. Now remember, logical analysis is to determine whether an inductive argument is strong or weak. A strong inductive argument is an argument in which if the premises were true, the conclusion is probably true. In other words, it is an inductive argument with good inductive reasoning. Or, yet another way of putting it, it is an inductive argument that actually fulfills the intent of the author. A weak inductive argument is an argument in which even if the premises were true, the conclusion would probably not be true. In other words, it is an inductive argument with poor inductive reasoning. Or, again in other words, it is 
an inductive argument that actually does not fulfill the intent of the author. Now let's turn to analogical arguments and discuss how we can actually evaluate the reasoning of analogical arguments. As we've discussed before, the framework of analogical argument includes two important premises and a conclusion. One of the premises observes that two things, x and y, have similar characteristics or qualities, a, b, c, etc. The other premise observes that one of the things, x, has another characteristic or quality, f. The conclusion asserts that the other thing, y, probably has the other characteristic or quality, f, as well based on the similarities observed in the premises. Now you might have noticed that in the second premise as well as the conclusion, the other characteristic or quality has been given the variable f. In part one of lesson seven, the characteristic or quality that was mentioned was given the variable k. x, y, a, b, c, and f are all simply variables, so it doesn't really matter what the actual variable is that we use. What's important is what it is that stands in for these variables. So as long as it's the case that the argument observes that one thing, whatever that thing is, has another characteristic or quality, whatever that quality is, as one of the premises, and then in the conclusion applies that characteristic or the quality, whatever it is, to the other thing that's being compared, it will be an analogical argument. Now we've looked at the framework of an analogical argument, but let me explain a little bit more about how the reasoning of an analogical argument works. Now what's going on with the reasoning of the analogical argument is that what the first premise does is it establishes that there are various similarities between two things that are being compared. The point of establishing these similarities is to suggest that the categories of the two things being compared, in our diagram here this would be x and y, are actually overlapping or may actually overlap with each other. So notice how in our diagram here we have the two categories x and y. Now what the second premise seeks to do is establish that the quality f whatever that quality may be, which is observed of one of the things that are being compared, actually belong not to simply that one thing alone, but to both of the things being compared, both x and y, due to the overlap that was established by the similarities in premise one. So the idea is that the things that are being compared because of their similarities, will also have the same quality that one of the things has. This is illustrated by the diagram that appears below. Notice how what's going on in the diagram is that given the overlap between the two categories of X and Y, which was established by the similarities of the first premise, the other characteristic or quality F is thought to belong not only to one of the things being compared, but both of the things being compared, x and y, because it too may belong in the intersection between x and y. So it is important for you to understand that for analogical arguments, the reasoning relies mostly on the fact that the two things being compared share various similarities. Given this, there are several things that you need to consider when you think about the strength of analogical arguments. When we consider the strength of analogical arguments, there are eight things that we want to consider. The relevance of the similarities being compared, the number of similarities, the nature and degree of disanalogies, the number of primary analogs, the diversity among the primary analogs, the existence of counter analogies, the specificity of the conclusion, and unintended consequences. We'll discuss each of these one at a time throughout this lecture. Now here are two examples of analogical arguments, a weak analogical argument and a strong analogical argument. These two arguments were actually introduced in part one of lesson seven.
The strong argument has as its premises the following statements. Painting with acrylic paints rely on similar brush skills and techniques compared to painting with oil paints. Joey can produce really great oil paintings of landscapes. And the conclusion is that Joey can probably produce really great acrylic paintings of landscapes. This is a strong argument, and we'll discuss why it is a strong argument. The weak argument has as its premises, oil painting and marble sculpting are both forms of art. Joey can produce really great oil paintings of landscapes. And the conclusion is Joey can probably produce really great marble landscape sculptures. Now notice that although one of these arguments is a strong argument and the other one is a weak argument, they both share the same structure or pattern of reasoning. This is why they are both analogical arguments, because analogical arguments have the following structure. One of the premises observes that two things, x and y, have similar characteristics or qualities. We see that this is being done in premise one of both of the arguments. Then. The other premise in an analogical argument observes that one of the things, x, has another characteristic or quality, f. As you can see, this is done in premise 2 of both of the arguments. Then finally, the conclusion asserts that the other thing, y, probably has the other characteristic or quality, f, as well, based on the similarities observed in the premises. Now, because it is the case that the reasoning in analogical arguments depends on the similarities that are established in one of the premises, it is important that the similarities are relevant to the conclusion being drawn. Now consider the strong argument. Premise 1 states that painting with acrylic paints rely on similar brush skills and techniques. Now having similar brush skills and techniques is actually very relevant to the conclusion that Joey can probably produce really great acrylic paintings. The reason for this is because the similarities of having similar brush skills and techniques helps the two categories of painting with acrylics and painting with oil paints overlap such that another property, the ability to paint great paintings of these kinds, can be applied to both of the things being compared. Now take a look at the weak argument. The weak argument states as the first premise, painting and sculpting are both forms of art. And then as the second premise, that Joey can produce really great oil paintings of landscapes. Then as the conclusion, it asserts that Joey can probably produce really great landscape sculptures. Now, in this argument as well, the similarity that is being drawn between painting and sculpting is that of them being both forms of art. Now, this is actually also relevant to the conclusion being drawn, that Joey can probably produce really great landscape sculptures. So here, the relevance of the similarities is really not an issue. Both of the similarities are relevant to the conclusion being drawn. So it's not because the similarities are irrelevant that one argument is strong and the argument is weak. However, in other cases, you may have weak arguments because the similarities that are being drawn is not relevant at all. Another thing that you need to consider is the number of similarities that are being drawn. Now, the more there are relevant similarities shared between two things being compared, the stronger the argument will be. And the less there are relevant similarities, the weaker the argument. Now again, consider the two arguments that are being compared here. The strong argument has two similarities that are being established. That Painting with acrylic paints and painting with oil paints are similar in the sense that they both have similar brush skills and similar techniques. The weaker argument establishes only one similarity, that painting and sculpting are both forms of art. Because we have less similarity being established in the weaker argument compared to the stronger argument, what happens is that there's less of a chance that the two categories between painting and sculpting will overlap, such that the other characteristic that is being noted of one of the things being compared may not actually fall in the intersection of the two things that are being compared. Another thing that you need to be concerned about is the existence of disanalogies. Disanalogies are differences between two things. They reveal characteristics of x that are not in y and reduces the probability that f is also in y. Remember, 
The reasoning of analogical arguments depend on the fact that there are similarities established between the two things being compared. The reason why we want to establish these similarities is because the more relevant similarities there are, the more likely another quality that one of the things being compared has will also be shared by the other thing being compared. Now, if it's the case that we have several different relevant similarities that are established between two things being compared, yet there are also very many differences between the two things being compared, what happens is the differences actually end up widening the gap between the things being compared. So look at our diagram here. We have the categories of X and Y. These are the categories of the two things being compared. Now the similarities of A, B, C, D, and E are established between these two things, which basically allow us to infer that these categories overlap in these ways. However, when there are disanalogies or differences between the two things, P, Q, R, and V, notice how these differences make it so that the two categories actually come apart rather than overlap. Given that the two categories are then pulled apart because of these differences, it makes it less likely that the other quality or characteristic being noted of one of the things being compared, in this case the characteristic or quality F, would not actually fall into the intersection of the two things X and Y. So being aware of relevant differences or disanalogies is very important to evaluating the reasoning of inductive arguments. Now when you consider the disanalogies that exist between the two things being compared in an analogical argument, you want to consider the nature and degree of these disanalogies. The less there are significant relevant dissimilarities between the two things being compared, the stronger the argument will be. And the more there are significant relevant dissimilarities, the weaker the argument will be. Now consider here our strong argument. The dissimilarities between painting with oil paint and painting with acrylic paint are that the paints dry differently, that the paints blend differently, and there are different preparation methods in painting. Now given these, it will weaken the likelihood of the fact that if Joey can produce really great oil paintings, he would also be able to produce really great acrylic paintings simply based on the similarity that painting with acrylic paints and painting with oil paints rely on similar brush skills and techniques. So these disanalogies will weaken this argument. However, it wouldn't weaken it to the extent where the argument would be a completely weak argument. So although this is considered a strong argument, you might say given these dissimilarities, the argument is more so a moderate argument. But remember, we are only using two values for degrees of strength in inductive logic. We're only going to use the values of strong and weak. Because this argument is more so moderate to strong rather than moderate to weak, we're going to consider this argument a strong argument. Now consider the weak argument we have here. Here, the relevant dissimilarities are oil paint and marble are two completely different mediums. The mediums use different tools, the mediums use different techniques, the mediums are amenable to different subjects. So given all these similarities, which the nature of these are very significant to the kind of conclusion that we want to establish, it makes this argument a very weak argument. Simply because oil painting and marble sculpting are similar in the fact that they're both forms of art is not enough to establish that they are similar enough such that if one can paint really great oil paintings of landscapes, one can also sculpt really great landscape sculptures. So this argument will be a weak argument. Now another thing that we want to consider is the number of primary analogs that an analogical argument has. A primary analog is basically a case which exemplifies the kind of case that the argument is about. What I mean by this is the following. Consider the strong argument we have here. 
this strong argument is about Joey, who can produce really great oil paintings, also being able to produce really great acrylic paintings. Now, if we can find other cases where people can produce really great oil paintings as well as produce really great acrylic paintings, then we have found primary analogs of this strong argument. Having greater cases of primary analogs will help strengthen the argument. The reason why having a greater number of primary analogs increases the strength of the analogical argument is because the primary analog increases the probability that the similarities noted in the argument are actually able to support the inference from the premises to the conclusion. In other words, the fact that there are a lot of people that are great oil painters as well as great acrylic painters seem to suggest that it's probable that the reason why they have this correlation may be due to the fact that both oil painting and acrylic painting rely on similar brush skills and techniques. Now consider the weak argument we have here. If there are other cases where great oil painters show they can be great marble sculptors, then the argument would be strengthened. If not, then the argument would be weakened. Now it's most likely the case that there are not very many people who are great oil painters who are also great marble sculptors. This would suggest that the similarity that's being noted in the premises that oil painting and marble sculpting are both forms of art would not actually support the inference from the premises to the conclusion of this argument. In other words, because there are not very many cases of great oil painters who are also great at marble sculpting, it seems to suggest that the similarity between oil painting and marble sculpting that's noted, that they are both forms of art, does not support the probability that if one is great at one thing, then one would be great at the other thing as well. So this is a weak argument from analogy, specifically because there are not very many primary analogs. Another thing to consider, other than the number of primary analogs that exist, is the diversity among primary analogs. The more there are differences in cases that are similar to the case the argument is about, the stronger the argument. The less there are differences in cases that are similar to the case the argument is about, the weaker the argument. Now, what does this actually mean in terms of the differences in the cases? Let's consider the strong argument here from analogy. Now, as we discussed in the previous slides, the primary analog to this kind of argument is if we can find cases where people can produce really great oil paintings as well as produce really great acrylic paintings, each of these cases will be primary analogs to this argument. Now, if it's the case that in each of these cases you have dissimilarities between the cases, then these cases would actually suggest that the argument in question is a strong argument. In other words, let us say that we have five different primary analogs to this case here we can find five different people who can produce really great oil paintings as well as produce really great acrylic paintings. Now, if it's the case that between these five different primary analogs, you have various differences between the cases, then the analogical argument in question becomes strengthened. The differences might range from each of the five people having different kinds of education, each of the five people having different kinds of background in terms of their experience with different forms of art, so on and so forth. The fact that there are various differences among the various primary analogs 
strengthens the argument because these differences help narrow down the cause of one being able to produce great oil paintings of landscapes as well as produce really great acrylic paintings to the similarity that both oil painting and acrylic painting rely on similar brush skills and techniques. So having various differences amongst primary analogs is very important in establishing the strength of an analogical argument. Now if it were the case that among our five primary analogs, there are actually a lot of similarities between them. Let's say that all five individuals went to the same school for art, all five individuals had the same teacher, so on and so forth, then this would actually significantly weaken the analogical argument. The reason for that is because, given that there are so many similarities between the primary analogs, there could be other reasons than the fact that acrylic painting and oil painting share similar brush skills and techniques, which could be the reason why these people who are great at oil painting landscapes would also be great at producing great acrylic paintings. So the fact that there are a lot of similarities between primary analogs would significantly weaken an analogical argument. Now this would be the case also with the weak argument we have here. If there are other cases where great oil painters show they can be great marble sculptors and there are many differences between them, then the argument would be strengthened. If not, then the argument would be weakened. Again, the reason for this is because finding many differences between primary analogs would show or help indicate that the similarity that the argument has suggested can support the inference from the premises to the conclusion. However, for this weak analogical argument, it actually doesn't matter that much what the number of diversity is between the primary analogs because it's the case that the number of primary analogs that exist is probably limited. So, simply because the number of primary analogs that exist is probably limited, this would still be a weak argument. However, the degree of support for this argument would be slightly strengthened if it were the case that the limited number of primary analogs did have a diverse amount of differences between them. Another thing that's important to consider when you determine the degree of support or the strength of an analogical argument is the specificity of the conclusion. The more general the conclusion of an argument, the stronger the argument. The more specific the conclusion of an argument, the weaker the argument. Now consider the strong argument we have here. Notice how the conclusion is pretty general. It's about Joey being able to produce really great acrylic paintings. Because this conclusion is pretty general, the argument is actually pretty strong. The reason for this is because there are more ways to fulfill this conclusion than if it were a really narrow conclusion. Compare this with the weak argument we have here. The weak argument states that Joey can probably produce really great marble landscape sculptures. Now notice how this is actually a very specific conclusion. It's about Joey being able to produce really great marble landscape sculptures. Now, because this conclusion is pretty specific, there are less ways for this conclusion to be fulfilled. In other words, in order for this conclusion to be true, it not only has to be the case that Joey is able to produce really great sculptures, these sculptures must be marble sculptures, and these sculptures must be sculptures of landscapes. So the more general a conclusion is, the more ways there are to fulfill this conclusion such that it becomes true, which means that the more probable the conclusion would be. And the less general a conclusion is, in other words, the more specific a conclusion is, 
the less ways there would be in order to fulfill this conclusion so that it is true, which means that the less probable the truth of the conclusion would be. So, the specificity of the conclusion will help gauge the strength of the argument. Another thing that you need to be concerned with are counter-analogies. A counter-analogy is a new competing argument, otherwise referred to as a counter-argument, that compares the subject of the conclusion to something else and then draws a conclusion that contradicts the conclusion of the original argument. In other words, a counter-analogy is in fact an analogical argument. It's an analogical argument that is given in response to the previously given analogical argument. It is a counter-argument not only because it's given in response to the previously given argument, but also because the conclusion of the counter-analogy is the opposite of the conclusion of the previously given argument. Now consider this diagram here. This is a diagram of the counter-analogy. What the counter-analogy will do is compare Y, which was the subject of the conclusion of the previously given argument, to another thing Z. And it will note various similarities between Y and Z, those being A, B, C, D, E, F, etc. Also, it will suggest that because Z has a certain other characteristic or quality H, that Y will have this other characteristic or quality H as well. And H may contradict the original quality F that the previous argument was applying to Y in its conclusion. Now let us see how counter-analogies will work for analogical arguments. Now, when you are considering counter-analogies to an analogical argument in order to figure out the strength of that argument, what you want to know is if there are strong counter-analogies to that argument. If there are strong counter-analogies to the argument, the weaker the argument. The existence of weak counter-analogies do not affect the strength of an argument. The reason why is because, as mentioned, counter-analogies are arguments. They are counter-arguments. In this sense, they are competing arguments to the argument previously given. And typically, they will have a conclusion that is the opposite of the previously given argument. So here what we have are two arguments arguing for opposite conclusions. In order to weaken one of the arguments, it has to be the case that the other argument is stronger than the one that is weakening. So, if you have an analogical argument, the only way to weaken that argument with a counter-analogy is to present a counter-analogy that is stronger than that analogical argument. Now let us consider the two arguments that we have been using as examples. Notice that for the strong argument here, there's no real strong counter-analogy that we can give. In other words, there's no real strong argument that we can give with the opposite conclusion that relies on the same similarities that are being used by the argument in question. Now, I might be wrong. There might be some counter-analogies that are strong that I have yet to consider. If you can think of a strong counter-analogy to compete with this strong argument, post it in discussion and we can further discuss the merit of that counter-analogy. Now consider the weak argument that we have here as an example. We can give as a counter-analogy to this argument the following argument. Marble sculpting is like clay sculpting in that they are both three-dimensional art forms. It is difficult to go from a two-dimensional art form like painting to clay sculpting. So it will be difficult to go from oil painting to marble sculpting. Notice that this counter-analogy is an analogical argument. What it does in one of these premises is compare marble sculpting to clay sculpting. Then it suggests that one of the things being compared, in this case clay sculpting, has the quality or characteristic of being difficult to transition from something like painting to that of clay sculpting.
Furthermore, in the conclusion, this quality or characteristic is applied to the other thing that was being compared in the premises. Note that the conclusion states that, so it will be difficult to go from oil painting to marble sculpting. Here, the quality or characteristic of it being difficult to go from one thing to another thing is being applied to marble sculpting. Now, in order for this counter analogy to actually weaken the argument in question, we have to consider the strength of this counter analogy compared to the strength of the previously given analogical argument. Now, we already know that the previously given analogical argument in question, which is the weak argument we have here, is already a weak argument. Furthermore, when we consider this counter analogy, we may find that it actually has a moderate to strong degree of support. Given this, then, we would conclude that the weak analogy is further weakened by the fact that there is a counter analogy which concludes the opposite of the conclusion of the previously given argument. However, if this counter analogy actually had a weak degree of support, then it would not affect the strength of the previously given argument. Remember, the counter analogy is a competing argument. So if the competing argument is not that strong, then the previously given argument would not be affected by the competing argument. One last thing to consider are unintended consequences. An unintended consequence is a counter-argument as well. It is an argument given in response to a previously given argument. It is meant to counter the previously given argument. The intent of an unintended consequence is to get the author to accept that his or her argument is weak. Unintended consequences fulfills the intent by presenting an argument that relies on the same analogy used by the author of the original argument, the one that the counterargument is responding to, while also concluding something that the author of the original argument would not be willing to accept. Unintended consequences presents the author of the original argument with a dilemma, either admit that the analogy is weak or accept the unintended consequence. An unintended consequence is successful only if the author accepts that the analogy of the original argument is weak based on the unintended consequence. Now note that unintended consequence is different from counter analogies. Although both are counter arguments, what a counter analogy does is it seeks to establish an analogical argument that argues for the opposite conclusion of the original argument. An unintended consequence does not seek to do so. It doesn't try to establish the opposite of the conclusion of the original argument. What it does instead is it relies on the similarity that the original argument has drawn in order to conclude a consequence that is unacceptable to the author of the original argument. By doing so, it gets the author to reconsider the similarity that they've used in their analogical argument. This is why it puts the author in the position of a dilemma. They must either accept the unintended consequence or admit that the analogy, the similarity that their argument relies on is weak so that they could suggest that the unintended consequence wouldn't follow. Now, if we look at the two arguments that we have here, it's the case that there are really no strong unintended consequences that we could draw from the similarities that are being used in either of these arguments. However, I might be wrong, and if you can think of some unintended consequences that can be drawn from the similarities that are used by these arguments, let me know in discussion and we can discuss the merits of these unintended consequences. However, let's say that there is at least one argument that is an unintended consequence that can be given in response to these arguments. Then, if the author of the original argument bites the bullet and accepts the unintended consequence, then the strength of the argument is not affected.
This is because in the situation of the dilemma, the author has decided to accept the unintended consequence rather than admit that the analogy or similarity that their argument relies on is weak. However, if the author of the original argument admits the analogy is weak based on the unintended consequence, then the strength of the argument is weakened. Now notice how simply having an argument that is an unintended consequence is not good enough to suggest that the argument in question is weak. What needs to happen is that the author of the argument, or at least the audience who is listening and evaluating these arguments, must accept that the unintended consequence shows that the analogy is a weak analogy. Now here is an argument for which we can give an unintended consequence. The argument reads, mammals like mice and rabbits, like humans, have intrinsic value. We do not allow humans to be tortured for the sake of science, so we should not allow mammals like mice and rabbits to be tortured for the sake of science. Now notice that this is an analogical argument. It compares two things, mammals, such as mice and rabbits, to human beings. And the similarity that they share is that they have intrinsic value. Then it also notes in the premise that one of the things being compared, in this case human beings, has another quality or characteristic. In this case, that we do not allow human beings to be tortured for the sake of science. Then in the conclusion, this quality or characteristic is applied to the other thing that's being compared. Thus, the conclusion states that we should not allow mammals like mice and rabbits to be tortured for the sake of science. Now, as an unintended consequence, what we want to do is provide an analogical argument that uses the same similarities that are drawn in the previously given argument. But the kind of conclusion that we want to conclude is something that the author of the previously given argument would not be willing to accept. Consider this unintended consequence to the argument just given. Mammals like mice and rabbits, like humans, have intrinsic value. Humans have the right to life, liberty, property, and equal protection under the law. So mammals like mice and rabbits also have the right to life, liberty, property, and equal protection under the law. Now notice how this argument is an analogical argument as well. However, unlike counter analogies, which are also analogical arguments that are counterarguments. This argument here, as an unintended consequence, relies on the same similarities that were established by the previously given argument. Notice the similarity here is that mammals like mice and rabbits, like humans, have intrinsic value. This is the same similarity between mammals and humans that was established in the previously given argument. However, what the conclusion is doing is drawing a conclusion which the author might not be willing to accept. The conclusion states that mammals like mice and rabbits should also have the right to life, liberty, property, and equal protection under the law. Now, the success of this unintended consequence is based on whether or not one is willing to accept that the unintended consequence weakens the analogy that's being used. So, if the author of the previously given argument accepts that mammals like mice and rabbits would have the right to life, liberty, property, and equal protection under the law, and they also accept that this would follow given the premises of the unintended consequence, then what they might do is admit that the similarity that they use, that mammals like bison rabbits, like humans, have intrinsic value, is actually not a good similarity. In other words, they might admit that the analogy employed is a weak analogy. By doing so, they would also weaken their argument because their argument relies on the same analogy or similarity. However, 
the author of the previously given argument might simply accept the unintended consequence and say yes, that they believe that mammals like mice and rabbits have the right to life, liberty, property, and equal protection under the law. By doing so, the author would not weaken their previously given argument, which relies on the same similarity that the unintended consequence uses. However, they would be put in a position to now have to provide further support for why accepting the conclusion of the unintended consequence would be reasonable. Finally, the effectiveness of the unintended consequence in weakening an argument would rely on the actual strength of that unintended consequence itself. If this argument that was given is actually a weak argument, then the unintended consequence would not affect the previously given argument at all. In other words, the author of the previously given argument can deliver themselves from the dilemma by simply arguing that the unintended consequence is a weak argument. By doing so, they would not be forced to choose between accepting the unintended consequence or admitting that their argument relies on a weak analogy. This is because they would simply argue that the unintended consequence is simply a weak argument. So there are several things that you have to actually consider in thinking about how unintended consequences affect the strength of an analogical argument. This marks the end of part two of lesson seven online lecture. Please let me know if you have any questions regarding the material discussed. I will see you next time for lesson eight. Have a good one.